All right. My son, just a couple of days ago, was in a meeting of pastors in Washington, D.C. There were about 400, I think, pastors there. He's, he w was in Iowa. That's how he got to meet Michelle Bachman. Uh, but now he's in Maryland, pastoring a church there, uh, Calvary Bible Church in Westminster, Maryland. And um, so anyway, he went to Washington for this preacher's meeting, and one of the speakers was um, Senator Rand Paul. And um, Matthew got the opportunity, was it just a year ago? Last, a year ago, January, I think it was, to go on a trip to Israel with Rand Paul and um, his family, uh, his wife and one son. And uh, Matthew ended up as the seatmate on the bus uh, with Rand Paul's teenage son and led him to Christ. And uh, they have maintained communications ever since. He emails um, the son and the wife and Rand Paul. And um, just the other day at this preacher's meeting, Rand Paul was speaking. He got up to speak and he noticed Matt in the audience and he pointed him out. And then uh, when he was exiting, uh, he stopped and talked to Matt and uh, asked him to uh, drop by his office sometime in Washington. Um, I say that just to say we need to take the opportunities that God gives us and we need to make opportunities. Um, that was the, that what has happened is a result of a lot of hard work uh, to try to get to know people that you ordinarily don't get to know. And um, it's been very effective, and we praise God for that. Um, take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. I think you guys have heard of this passage somewhere along the line. Um, I met Dr. Arnold, a uh, Yankee, um, I think in the summer of 1967 at Boca. Um, and uh, probably on the football field. Uh, but uh, anyway, we had a lot of good times together. We were together for a year uh, at Florida Bible College, and then he graduated and left. Uh, I met Dr. Lindstrom also at Boca. And uh, one of the things that, when, when I first saw him, um, I had not heard him speak yet. But I don't know if any of you all ever went to the Florida Bible College summer camps, but um, Christian Youth Ranch camps. Um, but we'd get together every morning at 7.30. Everybody would, you know, get up, get dressed, gather together in a central location. And at Boca, it was outside. And um, the heat and humidity of uh, an August morning and I was sweating like crazy already. Um, and here they would have someone to, to start us off with a very brief devotional, then we'd split up and, and have private devotions. And here's Hank. And he's standing up on, on something above everybody and, and speaking. And he looks absolutely as cool as a cucumber. I don't think the man ever sweated. Um, of course, then I got to hear him speak on a number of occasions at uh, camp and at Florida Bible College, and his handling of the Word of God uh, was just a marvel. Uh, he was one of those men that you would hear and you'd say, I want to be like that. I want to be able to do what he does, uh, to be able to take the Scripture and just explain it to where people get it, to where people can understand it. Uh, there's a lot of preachers today that seem to have an, the idea that you know, good sermons are complicated, that they have to have a whole lot of big words and, and theological expressions. And if you don't leave people somewhat confused, you haven't done the right thing. Um, the Bible declares exactly the opposite. We're supposed to open the book 
and read it and explain it, where people leave knowing more than when they came in. Um, so, this morning what I want to talk about, and this is something that, that I've had, had personal conversations with uh, Pastor Arnold and Betty, um, is about, and, and the, here's the title of my sermon, The Errors of Six-Point Calvinism. And you say, wait a minute, I always heard of five. They're, oh, yeah, yeah, well, Calvin, Calvin had hundreds, I'm sure, and most of them were wrong. I, I have heard a man that I thought I respected. I have heard a man say that John Calvin was one of the greatest exegetes of Scripture that ever lived. And that is so far off, it's amazing. Um, if you can burn people at the stake and drown people in the river and drive them out of town into a Swiss winter and say you got that from the Bible, you're not an exegete. Okay? And that's the kind of man John Calvin was. And if that bursts anybody's bubble, well, it needed bursting. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And um, what, I, what I normally like to do, and I love to do, is to uh, take a passage of Scripture and just go verse by verse through it. And that's my favorite way of teaching, is verse by verse, expository teaching of the Word of God. And in my ministry, that's what I have primarily done. That's not what I'm going to do this morning. We're going to jump all over. Okay? Um, but... Um, we're going to start with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Would you pray with me? Our gracious Father, I want to thank you so much for the Word of God. I thank you, Lord, for the very plain and simple declaration of Scripture that we are saved by grace through faith. And Father, I think this passage and many, many, many passages of Scripture make it very, very clear that this offer of salvation is made to every single person on the face of the earth. There is not a person who cannot be saved. There is not a person for whom Jesus Christ did not die. Lord, would you help us please to understand uh, some of the theological errors of our day, errors that have been around for centuries, but which are raising their head again in our day and tempting and seducing many, many pastors and many churches and, and even entire denominations into preaching a message that stifles the gospel, that hinders evangelism, that perverts the gospel, changing it into a message of works, and thereby keeps many, many people lost. I would ask you, please, to help me as I preach. Fill me with your spirit. Give me your power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I think you're familiar with TULIP. Uh, I'm going to add an S uh, to that. We'll call it TULIPS. Um, the first five points of Calvinism you are probably somewhat familiar with. I know that your pastor opposes them heartily. And uh, I commend him for that. I have a great deal of respect for your pastor. I really do. And for his wife. She's as tough as he is. Uh, and I appreciate that. 
very, very much. Um, we've had some interesting conversations over the years. T, his total depravity of man. Uh, there was a time that I would have said, well, I believe in two points of Calvinism. Uh, and that was total depravity of man, the first point, and the perseverance of the saints, the last point. And the truth is, I didn't understand exactly what that meant. And when I gained more knowledge of what Calvinism really says, I understood I didn't agree with any of them. Okay, I am a zero pointer. Okay, Calvinists like to make a big deal. Well, I'm a two pointer, I'm a three pointer, I'm a four pointer, I'm a five pointer. Uh, no, I'm a zero pointer. I don't believe a single solitary one of them. Now the Calvinist exclaims at that, oh, you're an Arminian. No, I'm not that either. I happen to believe the Bible. Okay, we are saved by grace through faith, and if you trust Christ as your Savior, you are saved forever. Okay, can never, ever be lost because we are kept by God himself. All right, total depravity of man. Man is lost and helpless. He is completely unable to save himself or even to contribute anything to his salvation. And at that point, we would all say, Amen. Amen. This is absolutely true. But the Calvinist does not stop there. Okay, the Calvinist says that man is completely unable to believe. He is incapable of exercising faith and must be this is one I went round and round on the telephone one time with a Calvinist on, on this he must be regenerated before he can have faith I heard that and I, I said to the guy wait a minute did you just say to me that a man has to be born again before he can believe and he said, well, yes. And I said, then you're saying he's saved before he believes. No, that's not what I'm saying. Wait a minute. You said he's got to be, and we went over it and over it, and he never saw how silly what he was saying was. Well, I read down to verse 9. We're only going to really look at verse 1. Because this is where they get the idea. This is one of the passages, not the only passage, but one of the passages that they use to teach that a man is unable to believe. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Here's the reasoning that they use. Okay, first, first of all, let me say this. The five points of Calvinism are so extreme, they are so important, if true, that every single one of them should be based on a clear, simple, undeniable passage of Scripture. Should be. If we're going to hold doctrines that strong, then we had better be able to find a place in the Bible that actually says it. Okay, But not one of the five points of Calvinism can you actually find a verse that says what they say they believe. Not one of them. And this is an example. We have a dead man. You all have probably had funerals in this church with a coffin, with a body in it. And that dead person cannot do anything. He can't breathe. He can't laugh at your jokes. Let me say I enjoy this church tremendously. I've heard more laughter in this church this morning than I heard in 16 years in the liberal church I grew up in. Okay, in fact, I don't remember everybody ever laughing in that church at all. And, of course, the truth was they didn't have anything to laugh about. Well... You have a dead man, a dead body. He can't do anything. And we understand that. We recognize that. That guy's dead. Okay? The spirit has left the body. It's an empty shell. He's not there any longer. Okay? And that body can do nothing. 
But then they say that that's the way it is with spiritual death. And that a person who is spiritually dead can do nothing. He is incapable of doing anything that would in any way have to do with salvation or anything else of a spiritual nature because he is spiritually dead and so he can do nothing. Well the problem is that is a, a leap of logic that is not Bible okay and if we're gonna have a doctrine we ought to have Bible for it not just human logic that seems right and I can remember hearing that and saying oh yeah that makes sense but then you get to thinking about it first of all is there a verse in the Bible that says man an unsaved man is incapable of faith there is no verse that says that okay not one anywhere okay read it cover to cover I've read it cover to cover quite a few times I haven't found it okay it's not there the analogy doesn't work because spiritual death and physical death are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. In the Garden of Eden, and I'm teaching creation versus evolution in my Sunday school class right now, and last week we talked about some of the, um, like the day-age theory and that kind of stuff that people, well-meaning sometimes, uh, try to, you know, fit in creation with an old earth. Uh, which is not necessary, but anyway. Um, Adam and Eve in the garden, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, tend the garden, and don't eat of that tree. Okay? They ate of the tree. God said, the day that you eat thereof, you will die. They did not die physically that day. They began to die physically, but they died spiritually the moment that they sinned. And then God comes to them the next day. And they're afraid. And they run and they hide, which is rather stupid. Um, you cannot hide from God. Sometimes we think it as well, but this is what they did. They ran and they hid. And God called them, why are you hiding? What's, what's going on? They had a conversation. God spoke to them. They spoke to God. God said things and they understood what he said. But they were lost. Lost people are capable of communicating with God. They can talk to God in prayer and God can speak to them through his word. In fact, Christ said, when I leave and go back to heaven, I'm going to ask the Father to send another comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, and he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He didn't say he's going to try and fail because they can't understand. He said he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit has come and he is in the business today of convicting people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And oftentimes he uses you and me to do that, which is a wonderful privilege that we have. So this idea that Ephesians chapter 2, and they have some other passages, and we won't take the time to go to all of them by any means, but the idea that spiritual death means that the inability to believe is not Bible. Okay, it also makes no sense. Um, everybody in this building is exercising faith at this very moment. You're trusting the pew you're sitting on. Okay, now I don't know if everybody here is saved or not. I assume that the great majority are. Um, but you're exercising faith and you exercised faith before you trusted Christ okay we all have the ability to hear a message and decide whether or not we believe it alright so this idea that man is unable to believe is not Bible it's not biblical and it's in error Adam and Eve are not the only examples when 
Abraham foolishly and wickedly told his wife, tell them you're my sister because they just might kill me to get you. What did God do? God appears to Abimelech in a dream and says, you touch that woman and you're a dead man. Okay? He got the message. Okay? He heard and he understood. And people today, if we will tell them, can hear and understand the gospel. Okay? All right. In this T, the T, Calvinism is guilty of reading into a passage of Scripture something that they want to be there. Okay? It doesn't say it, but they read it into the passage and act as though it is there, and it's not. Okay, let's go to you. Unconditional election. God chose certain individuals to be saved, and that choice was not based on any conditions whatsoever. And uh, I am used to, turn, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, okay? You can turn while I'm talking. Um, usually in my, in my teaching and preaching, I print out verses ahead of time and we distribute them to the congregation. And so I've kind of gotten out of the habit of giving people time uh, to turn in your Bible. But we don't have that this morning. And I do want you to see these things. Um, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. What's that? Did I? I'm sorry. If I said first Ephesians, I was really mixed up. <laughs> Pardon me. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Okay, now the Calvinist says that there are no conditions for God's election. That God elects, He chooses, and essentially in eternity past, God went, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. okay, you're saved, eeny, meeny, miny, oh, you're saved, and all those others are not. Okay, that's what they say God did. With no conditions, not according to how good you are, not according to your, your race, your color, your ethnic background, how tall you are, how short you are, how heavy you are. No conditions whatsoever. Okay, well that's... People are not saved according to any of those conditions. But God chose, the Bible says, according to the foreknowledge of God. There is a condition, and the Bible says there's a condition. And the Calvinist, in this case, denies something that the Bible says is true. There is a condition. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, they say that election is, is without condition, uh, and that's wrong. Here we see that predestination also has the same condition. You are predestinated... Um, according to whom he foreknew. God foreknows certain things. And based upon what God foreknows, he made some choices and decisions. Now, we can't get, a, get away from this passage without showing what predestination means, and it's not part of TULIP. But anyway, another one of the points of Calvinism. He also did predestinate to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore be saved. Ah, you mean I didn't read it right? Well, they don't read it right either. 
okay? They don't read it right either. Here's what it says, that for whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God has predestinated, and if there's anybody here that has a struggle with eternal security, if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are predestinated by God that someday you are going to stand in his presence and you will be just like Christ. That's what God has predestinated. He did not predestinate you to believe, but he predestinated that believers someday would be like Christ. We are going to be in glory someday. may not be long. It could be very, very soon. But we are going to be in glory all together, this wonderful, grand family of God, Christ, the firstborn among many brethren, and we are going to be conformed to his image. We will be like him. You know, I love going to church. I have loved going to church for a long, long time. It is the most enjoyable place I ever go. I heard Curtis Hudson one day say, sometimes people you know, tell me that I shouldn't laugh in church. Curtis Hudson had a fantastic sense of humor. He loved to tell jokes. Um, and he said, if I didn't laugh in church, I'd never laugh because church is the only place I go. <laughs> well, the fellowship of the saints is going to be glorious. Because Peter here, an angel, an angel really needs it. <laughs> Angel's one of those guys that's just so easy to pick on. <laughs> and everywhere he goes, people do it. We're all going to be like Christ. The love that we have for each other is just going to be magnified so greatly when we get to glory because none of us will be a sinner anymore. We are going to be like Christ. I can hardly wait for that day. I get so tired of myself sometimes, okay? And I want to be like Christ. And we'll all be like Christ. And God has predetermined that that's going to happen. Okay? Now, I have, I have said that the Calvinist refuses to believe something that is right there in the Bible. Okay, well, here's how they, they weasel out of it. They say that God, and this is incredible to me, that they can be so stupid. They say that God only foreknows the future because he has predetermined the future. He only knows what's going to happen because he has decided it's going to happen. The Greek language, like the English, has a word for predetermine. And it has a word for knowing ahead of time, foreknowledge. And they are two different words from two different roots, and they mean totally different things. God has no difficulty whatsoever in expressing himself clearly. And if God means predetermine, he's not going to say foreknowledge. Okay? God foreknows everything because he, he's God. He has the ability to know everything that's ever going to happen. But he only predetermines what he chooses to predetermine. And he has not predetermined your faith. But he has elected you to be part of the, the body of Christ because of your faith. God looked down in eternity past, and he knew every one of your names. He knows the name of every person on the planet. 
and he sees those who will believe and he has chosen that you will be part of the body of Christ through faith in his son. Okay, he did not choose you and say, I'm going to give you faith and give you faith and give you faith and give you faith, but the rest of your neighborhood, I'm going to let them go to hell. And in fact, I'm going to send them to hell for not believing when they didn't have the ability to believe. Okay? I mean, a lot of the things the Calvinists say about God are really ugly. They really are. Okay. Let's go on. Um, well, let me, let me say this. The, the, the condition for election is foreknowledge. What is it that God foreknew? I've already said it, basically, and that is who will believe. Okay? The only, other, the only condition in Scripture for salvation is faith. That is the only condition. It is found hundreds of times through the Scripture, and one way or another, God says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Faith is the only, the one and only condition for salvation. That's what God foreknows, and he chooses those who believe. Limited atonement. Christ died only, only for the elect. John 3.16 doesn't really mean what it seems to say. Okay, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a very simple statement of Scripture. Okay, very, very simple. It, it's so easy to understand. Okay, it's, it's oftentimes mixed up. It's oftentimes confused, but the, the simple statement is very clear. But the Calvinist would say this, For God so loved the world of the elect, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever of the elect believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so they are inserting some words that you can't find in the text. Okay, if you examine the scripture, it's not there. So they add something that isn't there because it fits their doctrine. So they have to change the scripture in order to make people believe their doctrine. Okay? And it isn't there. So they change the meaning of words. Whenever God says, whosoever, or he that believeth, or if any man believeth, um, if he uses the word world, well, he really meant the elect. Okay? That's what it really means. Now again, I have a problem when anybody tells me that God is not capable of expressing himself in a way that I can understand it. Okay, that, to me that makes no sense. God is the God of the universe. God has all power, all intellect, all ability, but he can't say elect when he means elect. He says whosoever instead of elect. He says world instead of elect. Is God deceitful? The Bible says that God cannot lie. God cannot lie. So how is it that he can't... I mean, this is Jesus Christ in John 3.16 giving the gospel to Nicodemus. And they say he didn't express himself clearly. This is nonsense. This is absolute nonsense. And it's, beloved, this is heresy. Okay, this is heresy. And I've got some folks who used to be friends of mine that I went to college with who now believe this drivel. And that's a shame. Okay, that's a, a downright shame. That's horrible. Well, I guess we ought to be grateful to Augustine and John Calvin for explaining these deeper truths to us. Uh, that's sarcasm in case you didn't get it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and let me say that, okay? John Calvin didn't come up with any of this stuff. John Calvin got his teaching from a man named Augustine that the Catholic Church calls Saint Augustine, okay? Who was 
the primary Catholic theologian that got the Roman Catholic Church started, okay, who is the one who gave John Calvin the justification for going out and executing people who didn't believe the same as he did, and that kind of thing. Augustine was a wicked man, and John Calvin was as bad or perhaps even worse. Um, go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. You quoted earlier 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, or pardon me, verse 1. Let's look at verse 2. 1 John 2, 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Calvinists have a difficulty with this verse. They weasel out of it. They still insist that um, he doesn't mean the whole world, even though he says whole world. Okay? But I want you to look at this verse. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Who do you think our means? Okay, the, the verse before, he says, my little children. Do you think John is talking to saved people? I think John's talking to saved people. And when he says our, he means us. Okay? Christ is the propitiation. He's the satisfactory payment for our sins. Our sins. Okay? Born again people. Christ died for us. Praise God. Praise God. But then he says, and not for ours only. He didn't just die for us. He died for the sins of the whole world. The whole world. There's not a person who has ever lived or ever will live that Jesus Christ did not die for. That he didn't die for. Everybody. Every single person. Well, the Calvinists in this letter, L, change the meaning of words to fit their doctrine. And they add words to Scripture that are not there. Irresistible grace is the I in tulip. If God elected you, then you have no choice. No choice. You must believe. You thought you chose to believe in Christ. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. That was a figment of your imagination. Okay? God chose you. God gave you the gift of faith. God regenerated you by the Holy Spirit so you could understand the gospel. He saved you, and then you believed. That's what the Calvinist says. It wasn't your volition. It was all God's choice. Irresistible grace. Everyone God wants to be saved will be saved, according to them. But it says Christ died for the world, the Bible says. And the Bible says God is not willing that any should perish. If it was God's will that every person he wants saved would be saved, then guess what? Everybody would be saved. That'd be a nice earth, wouldn't it? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not true. Or fortunately, praise God, it isn't true. God's not in the business of making people believe. God offers salvation. I won't give you time to turn to this one, but let me, let me read this. Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets... And stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. And ye would not. Christ, a day before he was killed, sitting, looking over the city of Jerusalem, and weeping over Jerusalem. And he says, I have often, so often, wanted to gather you together. I sent to you the prophets, and you killed them. I sent more prophets, and you stoned them. And I have tried and tried and tried to bring you to myself, but you would not. 
You would not. Okay? We have got, I think, three problems with evangelism in our day. The first one is too many have never heard. And a lot of times that's your fault and my fault. Okay? A lot of people have never heard. And a lot of times it's because Christians haven't been willing to tell them. Too many have heard an unclear message where the gospel might be in there somewhere. When I got saved at 16, I was a member of a, of a club called Key Club in high school. And one of the things that we did during the school year was we went to various churches. We'd all put on our suits and stand around and think we were important. And uh, we'd visit all these different churches. Well, there were some churches I went to before I got saved. Then I trusted Christ, and I went back to a couple of those churches after. And I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute. That's the gospel, I think. Okay, but I, I didn't understand it until somebody sat down and explained it to me. And then I went back to some of these and says, yeah, they're, they're kind of preaching it. You know, but not exactly. And it's covered up with all this other stuff. You know, I ran into a lady the other day, actually, she's one of my doctors, who's saved. I witnessed to her. She understands the gospel. She's Roman Catholic. But in the Catholic Church, they even hear the gospel every now and then. It's covered up by tons of other stuff. But every now and then, there's somebody that they heard... I mean, the priest might have stood up at Mass and read John 3.16, and they get saved. Well, two, two, three problems with evangelism. People don't hear because we don't tell them. People hear an unclear message that they can't understand. There's a lot of preachers out there doing that. The third one is there's an awful lot of people who have heard and have understood, and they turn God down flat. Okay, and that's their problem. Okay, and they will answer for that. Okay, the Calvinist says that you cannot resist the will of God. But you and I resist the will of God all the time. Anybody here a sinner? Oh, look at all those hands. My goodness. You see, you resist the will of God. God says do this, and you say, eh, some other time. Okay, not today. Not today. God says don't do that. You say, oh, but I like that. Okay, we resist the will of God. The P is perseverance of the saints. Those who were truly elected and exercised saving faith. There's a book out. I don't know if it's still in print. It's not worthy of being in print. But there's a book out called Saving Faith. That's the title of it. And the guy makes a big deal in the book about trust Christ as your Savior, that phrase not ever being found in the Bible. And it isn't. You cannot find those words altogether, trust Christ as your Savior, anywhere in the Bible. That's true. But you also can't find saving faith anywhere in the Bible. Okay, that's not found either. Those who are truly elect will persevere to the end as faithful Christians. They will not fall away or fall into sin and so prove they were not elected at all. Now, the Calvinists and the Arminians say that there are two schools of theology, Calvinism and Arminianism. They say the rest of us don't really exist. Okay, you're either one or the other in their minds. Okay? The Calvinist says that if you sin really bad, you were never elected. You were never saved in the first place. The Arminian says if you sin really bad, you had salvation, but you lost it. Okay? In both systems, you have to be good to eventually get to heaven. Okay? And when you're not good in either system, they say you've got to get good or you're not going to make it. 
Okay, if you're not persevering, well, you better persevere or you won't get to heaven. I read a book by, by this one Calvinist that said that eternal security is a terrible doctrine. Teaching people you can have assurance of salvation is a terrible thing because they might not persevere and not get to heaven. And I thought, wait a second. I thought you were elected to perseverance. If it's all God, then what difference can me be teaching? I mean, it's just, I mean, this makes no sense whatsoever. If you're confused, welcome to the club, okay? Because they are confusing. But they change the gospel, okay? They really and truly do. And yet the scripture says we are held in Christ's hand and that he's held in God's hand. And that's how we're going to heaven. Okay, some of you guys have little kids, right? And a bunch of you have grandkids. Well, when you go into one of these ladies' stores that's full of all these knickknacks and, you know, all this glass and china and all this beautiful stuff, and it's all very fragile, okay? And you go in with your grandkid. What do you do? Do you stick your finger down? I mean, two years old, right? Three years old. Do you stick your finger down for him to hold on to? No, you get a death grip on that guy's hand. Okay? You're not getting anywhere near that stuff. Okay? I mean, isn't that the way? Well, are, are we holding on to God? No, God's holding on to us. And he won't ever let go. And that's why we can say, I know I'm going to heaven when I die. Okay, well... Those are the five points of Calvinism, but there's a sixth point. This is the reason for the other five, and that is the Calvinist doctrine of the sovereignty of God. God is the sovereign of the universe. The universe belongs to God. There is no power in the universe that can fight against God. Okay, God is the victor. Sometimes people think, well, God and Satan are, are equal and they're, no, uh-uh. No, Satan's a created being. You and I were created. All the angels were created by an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise God. The Calvinist, though, doesn't stop there. The Calvinist says God makes all decisions. Now, a lot of them won't admit that, but this is what they believe. God makes all decisions. No decision of God can be opposed or thwarted. If he's really all-powerful, if he's really sovereign, this is their reasoning. No one can go against his will in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so everything that happens, good or bad, happens because God willed it to happen. God makes all decisions. Okay, I asked a general question, are there any sinners here? And a bunch of hands went up. Some of you didn't raise your hand, you just were a little slow. <laughs> because we're all sinners. I know that, and you know that. God said to you yesterday, maybe, give a tract to that lady, witness to that kid. And maybe you said, uh, this isn't a convenient time. There's too many people around or whatever, and you didn't do it. Or God says, turn off that TV show. It's not very clean. And you said, oh, but it's fun. And you left the TV on. Did God make you do that? The Calvinist says he did. God makes all decisions. And God made me wear this tie today. The Calvin I had a Calvinist tell me that. Okay? God chose that tie from before the foundation of the world. Sounds a little far-fetched, huh? Okay, at least it matches. 
God's got good taste. <laughs> Pardon me, Lord. We oppose God every day. We oppose God's will. I have read a Calvinist say, God made Adam and Eve sin in the garden. Okay? And God makes you sin. Isn't it funny? God makes you sin, but he's going to punish you for something he made you do. He's going to send thousands, millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people to hell because of sin they committed that God made them commit. Does that sound like the God of the Bible? Can I get a little more enthusiasm? Does that sound like the God of the Bible? No. No. It doesn't sound like the God of the Bible. It's actually absolutely the opposite of the God of the Bible. Let me, let me read you some verses real fast. Now, I was told, I cannot let you out before noon. Okay, because this is third Sunday, and there's a dinner back here, and the ladies don't want you in there early. Okay, so I was told, you've got to go to noon. Beloved, there's no problem. Okay? Now, I'll, be, I'll be winding up pretty quick here. Let me read you some verses. Joshua 24, 15. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Deuteronomy 30, 19. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 applies to us. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us, be ye reconciled to God. It seems to me, and this, this, I gave you three, but there's hundreds of places in the Bible, God appeals to people, make a decision, and make the right decision. Okay, God did not determine everything you've ever done. God gives you a free will. The Calvinist absolutely, totally, completely denies that and makes nonsense of most of the Bible. Okay, he really does. All of these five points are necessary because of their idea of sovereignty. Okay, if God's will cannot be thwarted, then grace has to be irresistible. If God's will cannot be thwarted, then Christ could die for just a few because most people won't believe, and you cannot disbelieve unless God chose you. It's impossible for God to make an offer and you turn it down according to their idea of sovereignty. And so the offer of salvation, whosoever will, is not true. It must mean of the elect. All of their doctrines are based on this crazy idea that God makes every decision and God causes everything to happen, including your sin. And yet James tells me that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Nobody can ever stand before God and say, you made me do it. That's a lie. You did it yourself. God didn't do it for you. Why is this important? Well, Calvinism hinders evangelism. If it's all been predetermined, what on earth are we going out witnessing for? The elect are going to be saved whether you tell them or not. And they're going to get it by osmosis or something. They're going to breathe it in through the air or something like that. But they're going to get it if they're really elect. And if they're not elect, heaven forbid, you should tell them Christ died for them. Because he didn't. So why witness? Why witness? Calvinism perverts the gospel. When they see so few Christians persevering, they begin preaching perseverance is necessary for salvation. And so you have to be good. And this is what all the Lordshippers do, the John MacArthur's and all those folks. Christianity's in pitiful condition in this country. But you don't change the gospel because you and I are living, living stinking lives. Okay? That's not what you do. You start preaching, preaching things like God's chastening. 
and the judgment seat of Christ and that kind of thing, and that'll help straighten up some people. Um, also, Calvinism has taken over many, many Bible colleges and seminaries. There's a lot of schools that 20, 30, 40 years ago were against Calvinism, and now they teach it. There are denominations that a generation or so ago were dead set against Calvinism, and now it's throughout their churches. Calvinism is growing by leaps and bounds through, through the work of men like John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul and others, uh, Piper and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you and I have got to stand. Okay, we've got to do whenever you have an opportunity to contradict this, this blasphemous, heretical teaching. We have to do something. Now, I understand that there's something that you guys have never seen before. And I want to make this very, very clear. Okay, in case there's somebody here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, and I know there's some first-time visitors, there could be people who've been coming here for ages and that never understood this. I doubt it, but could be. I want you to let my right hand, okay, there's not really a hand there, but anyway, we'll let this represent you and me, okay? We'll let my wallet represent sin. I did this on a street in Chicago one time. I stopped this couple of teenagers going down the street, and I'm sitting there like this, and a police car pulled right up beside them, pulled into the curb, and here are these two cops sitting there listening to me. They probably thought a drug deal was going down. Okay, I re honestly, I think they did. They were suspicious, but they got to hear the gospel. Uh, what they did with it, I have no idea. God loves us, but he hates our sin. Okay, this is us. My wallet represents sin. God loves us. He hates our sin. Heaven is an absolutely perfect place. God is an absolutely holy God. And to get to heaven, the sin has got to be gone. Okay, our sin keeps us out of heaven. God loves us. He wants us to go to heaven. Let this hand represent Jesus Christ. God in the flesh. He came to this, this earth, lived a perfect life, never, ever, ever sinned because he was God and man. He went to the cross not simply because Pontius Pilate was a corrupt politician or anything like that. He went to the cross deliberately, willingly, because he was going to take your sin and my sin away. He died and he paid for that sin. He rose from the dead and the Bible says if we trust Christ, we will be in him. Now let me show you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now most guys that do the hand gesture can't do this part. Okay? There was one other guy at FBC named Rookie Roselle who was missing his right hand as well. We used to play tennis together. We had the only two-handed doubles team in the world. <laughs> anyway. If you don't, I'm, I'm being funny, I know that, but this is serious, okay? If you don't know Christ as Savior, ask yourself, would I go to heaven if I died today? And if you can't say for sure, then you need to understand this. You're a sinner, you deserve hell, but God loves you, and he gave his son to die for you. He was buried and raised from the dead. He's alive. And he's able to save you if you will simply put your trust in Christ. If you will believe in him. Don't trust your good works, your church membership, your water baptism, hanging on to the end. Nothing. Christ and Christ alone can pay your sin debt and save your soul. Trust him to save you, and he will. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Every head bowed, every eye closed. If there's anyone here who's never trusted in Christ, I want you to consider, what does it take to get to heaven? Are you going to stand before God and say, 
Lord, I was good. I went to church and I got baptized and I did this and I did that. If you do that, he's going to say, I'm sorry, you were a sinner and you deserve to go to hell and that's where you'll go. But would you stand before God and say, Christ died for me. I don't deserve heaven for a moment. Christ died for me and I trust him as my savior. If you've never trusted him, do it now. Do it now. You might say something like this between you and God. Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve heaven, but I know Christ died and paid for my sins. He was raised from the dead, and I'm trusting him right now to give me eternal life, everlasting life. Now, if you did that just now, in a moment I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up. Raising your hand won't save you. It won't help to save you. But I'd just like to know if anyone trusted Christ this morning. So if you trusted Christ this morning, you didn't do it before, but you did it this morning, is there anyone would just slip your hand up real quickly? I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'd just like to know. Is there anyone who would say, Pastor Floyd, I just trusted Christ? Just slip it up and put it back down. I don't see any hands, so I hope that means everybody knows Christ. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of opening your word to these dear folks. We thank you, Lord, that the Bible has the answers to these isms that men have created. And Lord, there's a lot of isms out there. There's a lot of false doctrine and false teaching, and Calvinism is one of the most deadly of them all. And may we withstand it in our own hearts and minds, and may we support those who stand against it. Lord, I thank you for Pastor Arnold, who I know stands firm against this heresy. And Lord, it is sweeping our country. And there are Christians who are falling prey to this. And uh, they think it's educated, they think it's wise, they think it's sophisticated or whatever. And they're falling for this. And I pray, dear God, that you'd help us. In Jesus' name, amen.